1995, long before the runaway box office success of Rush Hour in The Matrix, visionary director Steve Wang was making martial arts movie history. Restricted by a modest $3.5 million budget and a grueling production schedule of only six and a half weeks, Steve worked tirelessly for up to 22 hours a day with ace fight choreographer Koichi Sakamoto and his alpha stunt team to create the first truly dynamic, exciting and technically accomplished martial arts action adventure ever produced by a Hollywood studio. The movie is Drive, starring action superstar Mark Dacascos and live-wire comedy talent Kadeem Hardison. What follows is a candid behind-the-scenes look at the people responsible for one of the most genuinely groundbreaking but largely undiscovered classics of modern action cinema. Born in Taiwan, Drive director Steve Wang grew up on a staple diet of kung fu flicks, both homegrown and imported from Hong Kong and Japan. And although he immigrated to the United States at the age of nine, his interest in the genre continued into adulthood. His first movie, Kung Fu Rascals, which unbelievably Steve made for a mere $40,000, is a remarkable debut project and a popular cult hit in many countries. The fluid, high-energy fight sequences in Guyver 2, Dark Hero, further consolidated his reputation with action fans upon its release in 1994. Steve has a distinguished background in conceptual artistry and special makeup effects, having previously worked with Academy Award winners Stan Winston, Rick Baker, and Dick Smith. Steve has sculpted creatures for such mainstream cinematic favorites as Gremlins, Godzilla, and Alien Resurrection. His highly developed sense of visual perception gives Steve a head start over many directors when it comes to the development and execution of high-impact fight action. Producer Mike Leahy recalls how Steve came to be involved in the Drive project. I met Steve Wang through a mutual friend of ours where he showed me a demo reel of some of the work that he'd done in the past. And immediately I knew I had to work with him on something. And we had an opportunity to go to Romania and check out some locations for a sequel to Fist of the North Star. And we realized that wasn't kind of going to fit our timeline, but another script fell into our lap called Drive, which Scott Phillips wrote. And we took that and adapted it to some of the important aspects that Steve wanted in the film, namely Mark Dacascos, um, who plays Toby Wong, and um, looking for someone that can have some comedy to bounce off of, and we thought of Kadeem. He'd just done Vampire in Brooklyn, I don't know if you've seen that film, but he's great in it. I mean, you know, he outshines Eddie Murphy. And uh, Dry fell, fell in our lap, and we went off to, uh, to now make this Hong Kong epic in uh, Lancaster, California. And what attracted me about Drive was that I felt it had very strong characters. It had some really a lot of neat things going for it, character-wise. And and that it was a road movie. I really loved that fact that it was a quirky road movie. The dialogue was snappy, it was funny, there was some really, really neat stuff in it. But overall, the structure of the film and the action style wasn't really what I wanted to do. It was more of a car chase, gun, gun battle kind of movie. 
So uh, I asked him, I said, well, I'll do this film if uh, you let me rewrite the action sequences to tailor more my taste, you know? And they said, yeah, sure, go ahead. There was like a, a pretty fair amount of collaboration between me and Steve on, the, on the, the final script. We went through a bunch of drafts together. Uh, in some cases, we'd just sit down and work out stuff together. In other cases, Steve would work on things, notes, or actually go over the draft and, and then give it to me, and I'd, I'd work on it again. Like the, uh, the gravel yard fight in the original script was this running gun battle in Land Rovers that was just way too much for the, for the budget and the, the time that we had. And uh, ultimately, I think it, it, it came out better just having more martial arts action in it. Two words come to mind when I think of drive. Singular vision. It was a beautiful thing when we all got together at my house for dinner one night in prep, where we all sat down and said, what are we making here? And, uh, and everybody across the table, Mark, Kadeem, Steve, and I, it was a singular vision. We were gonna take this money, and it wasn't a lot of money. We were gonna take this money and make the kick-ass Hong Kong movie. Uh, with English uh, as the premier language. It was just a six and a half week rush. I mean, I was tired basically the whole time. After the first day, I was tired the whole month and a half. But I've never been so happy and excited on a project consistently all the way through, you know. And I've never gotten so beat up before in my life. But I was always happy to get beat up, you know, because I would see dailies the following day and go, man, this is working. It was a script that, was, uh, that probably would have never made it to me. But my agent at the time, they knew I'd been talking about Hong Kong and action and, and animation and just the kind of things I talked about wanting to do as an actor and sent me this little script that they said was going to be like, you know, a karate style, da, da, da. and I read it, and I liked the character, and there were things I could relate to, and I saw places where I could definitely boost it up a little bit comedy-wise, but I didn't see, you know, on the paper, you can't read action, you can't read how it's going to look. So they said, if you like it, we'll set up a meeting with the director. Okay. And I met Steve Wang, and, uh, and actually, I think first, before I met him, I got, they sent me tapes of what he had done. They sent me uh, Kung Fu Rascals and Giver. And then after seeing that, I was like, oh, I definitely want to meet this guy. You, you telling me that this guy it lives in America? I got to meet him. For me, I've never set out to be an art filmmaker. You know, I've never wanted to go out and say, you know what, I'm going to make Dances with Wolves or, although I would personally would love to have done a film like that. Um, my, my main goal as a, a filmmaker, at least for now, is that I want to entertain people. I want to be able to take them away from their, their homes for two hours or video or whatever, and to be able to just entertain the shit out of them. And the one thing that Drive proved to me was that I had the ability to do that. And that really meant a lot to me because early on, from the early test screenings up till the final version of the film, the screening was, was consistent all the way through, every single time. The audience loved it. They were howling, they were cheering, laughing through the, through the entire film. The, re the reactions were phenomenal. I've never made a film that got that kind of reaction. Walking on the drive as a stunt fight coordinator was uh, almost like uh, someone give you a playground. You know, play, do whatever you want to do. Because uh, uh, me and Steve work together very closely, and he gives me a lot of control as far as the scheduling, camera angle, uh, creativity for the fight choreography. So we all work together well. I think drive is strongest in that it's, it's a Hong Kong style action film so it has those elements for people who really love martial arts action at the same time it's got a very nice uh, group of characters Mark Dacascus, Kadeem Hardison, Brittany Murphy um, they're all wonderful together and the energy on the screen is great and uh, in a lot of our previous screenings there was a great response to the interactions just for the characters. So we had a great female response to the movie. We had great uh, people who don't even watch martial arts films, who I know really enjoyed this film uh, for those reasons, because they got behind the characters, they liked the comedy in it, and then the action was, you know, fantastic. 
Early on, I knew we had something special. Everybody plugged in 110% as far as, you know, working on Sundays, seventh days. I remember Steve would literally, literally, and that's just, this isn't just a story. He would literally shoot with a crew all day long. Then we would send everybody on the first crew home and bring a second crew in, keep our main stunt guys, and Steve would work well into the evening. And sure enough, we had a call time the next morning at 7 a.m with the first crew that had gone home and slept and ate dinner and spent time with their family. And Steve would go the next day, he would take, we'd take lunch at noon or one o'clock, he would go and sleep his 35 minutes during lunch. And I remember this, this sad, sad looking guy come stumbling, you know, the poor PA's gotta go knock on the door to wake up this director that's been up 24 hours, you know, sleeping for 35 minutes. And I remember Steve showing up on the set after one lunch. You know, everyone, uh, the whole first crew has gone home, right? So they're having lunch, eating away, and Steve walks out with these big bags under his eyes, just totally lost to the world. But he was a mission, man. He had a singular vision. This is the time we have to make this movie happen from this date to this date. And he just kicked ass, you know, every moment he could. Myself, personally, I'm not a huge martial arts action fan. But watching the way this film was put together and watching the things that Steve did on set with Mark Dacascus, uh, the wire work, Mark is amazing, did, did virtually all his own stunts in this film. Uh, it was amazing to watch for anybody. The acrobatics and the dance quality of the film uh, was, is, is really exciting to watch. Heading up the talented cast, physical genius Mark Dacascos has been learning martial arts since the age of four. Indoctrinated in the effective street art style, Wun Hop Kyun Do by his father Al DeCoscos, Mark is as effective off the screen as he is on. Producer Mike Leahy vividly remembers his first introduction to Hawaii's answer to Bruce Lee. Specifically, I remember the first time meeting Mark DeCoscos. We went to uh, a restaurant in, uh, in the valley. And Steve was pretty adamant about us needing to hire this guy, Mark DeCoscos. And I met Mark, and he was telling a story, and at one moment he moved his hands. Uh, I'm doing it about one one hundredth of the speed that Mark moved his hands. And it was like I was sitting across from a puma that was just so delicate and so graceful and so methodic in his approach. While he's eating a hamburger, I just knew this was the guy that we needed to hire. Mark was the guy I wanted from the beginning for this movie. Because the one thing that it's really hard is a lot of people in Hollywood, you know, the, the guys who make the big movies, you know, they don't understand this. And that is, it's really hard to cast somebody who can do the acting, give the performance, who can also do the action that is required in this kind of movie without looking like they've been doubled every five seconds. I love to train in martial arts. I was a Hawaiian boy spending most of my teen years in Hamburg, Germany, and my sanctuary was in the Kung Fu school. I was a foreigner, and although I had a lot of good friends, Kung Fu and Jackie Chan was a huge influence in my life. Matter of fact, when I was 17, I, I moved to Taiwan for six months and I studied martial arts there and I actually got to meet Jackie Chan when I was 17 years old. He was a huge influence and I think Jackie Chan was the one that inspired me to really get into gymnastics and do flips and all that. Matter of fact, I attribute myself um, almost breaking my back to a Jackie Chan film. <laughs> I, in, one, in, in, in one of the movies I saw him do, he, uh, he ran up something and did a backflip. And I thought, oh, that looks so cool and he does it so well. I don't know if it's, it doesn't, it, you know, he, he made it look like it was not that hard. So I went back to our Kung Fu school and the ceilings were only, I don't know, maybe nine, nine and a half feet high, 10 feet high. And there was this beam in the middle of the gym, and I thought, okay, well, I'm just gonna run right up the beam and do a backflip, because I can do a backflip, so I'll just run up and do a backflip, it'll be even easier. And what happened was I ran all the way up to the top that my head, my, my, my head hit the ceiling. So before I even did the flip, I was falling backwards and bam, hit my back on there, you know? Um, so I realized that it was not as easy as it looked. However, a couple months later, I tried it again and made it, and was aware of the ceiling. 
But Jackie Chan was just, he was huge for me. Bruce Lee and Jackie Chan. Working with Mark DeCasco, that was a great experience because Mark himself is a martial artist. He does Kung Fu the kind of style that we like. And Mark can perform all his stunts himself. Physically, he's a very talented person, not just the martial arts, but also gymnastics, acrobats, acting between the fight, everything. A lot of times, some actors, even though they do fight scenes, but their face totally dead when they do a fight scene. Hmm, like this, there's no expression on their face. But Mark got everything. And uh, he's better than a lot of stun guys out there. So we uh, had the great fun. I asked Mark, can you do this? He said, sure, no problem. He performed. As an actor, Mark has got a real unique quality that a lot of the quote-unquote um, action stars don't have. It's a vulnerability, it's a likability, it's a charm that we really try to capture and drive. Instead of him giving you just a tough guy, Mark brings a whole different aspect to it where he can have that, but he also can be really vulnerable and tender and comedic, which I think worked really well in the movie. As an actor, it was very challenging. As a martial artist, it was extremely challenging because anything that I had learned in my life, Koichi and Steve were pretty much putting it to use. Um, uh, so I, I did a movie called Only the Strong and some of the Capoeira moves we used. Uh, I was a gymnast and they used that, you know, the things that I could do, they, they put that in there and then all of the martial arts and kung fu fighting, of course. Um, matter of fact, I've never even trained as a singer, and Steve still put that to use. <laughs> as a matter of fact, he got me to write my own lyrics, so I wrote the lyrics to that song. And uh, initially, originally, uh, he was only going to have me do the first two or three lines. And then um, he, I recorded the song a couple nights prior to when we actually filmed it, and he liked it, so he ended up having me sing the whole song. Matching Mark's physical prowess with charisma and comedic flair is co-star Kadeem Hardison. As one of America's best up-and-coming comic talents, Kadeem was the perfect choice for the pivotal role of Malik Brody in Drive. We just arranged a meeting with, with Kadeem and met with him, and right away I thought, this is the guy, this guy's perfect. You know, Kadeem was such a talented actor, great at ad-libbing and uh, imp improvisation. Oh, Y'all going, this ain't the Batmobile, man. You made it throw a rod, it's a whole car. And uh, so we got Mark and Kadeem together and, uh, you know, to dinner to see, to see the whole chemistry thing. And I was so happy that there was chemistry there. It was, it was, it was just amazing how these two guys could really kind of feel comfortable with each other. I felt my job was to, to make Mark laugh and to make him feel at ease. So we were in the car one time. And uh, he tells me this story about the bio engine that he has in his chest. And as an ad lib, I said, really? Wow, that's a pretty amazing coincidence, Toby, because I have one in my ass. He wanted to really be serious in that moment. You know, that's one of those moments where, you know, he could come back at me with some fire. So when I say I have one in my ass, Marcos, <laughs> you can see him just smiling just a little bit. And he hates it. Every time he watches, every time he gets to that moment, he jumps up and he screams about he should have been serious in that moment. Well, he could have been, but it was funny. One of the, one of the great things about working with Kadeem is that um, as an actor, as a real, real life person, you never know what he's gonna do. He could be uh, just uh, one line or maybe not even a line, and somehow the bastard sneaks in lines that are so funny and pertinent to the script. That, that you just got to keep him in there, and, and Steve did. Steve was, I mean, he was the first one to crack up. Well, I'm trying to keep a straight face, working with Kadeem the Funny Man. In addition to his undeniable chemistry with Mark, Kadeem also sets the sparks flying with effervescent co-star Brittany Murphy, who played gun-toting wildflower Deliverance Bodine. When Brittany came on the set, she just, it like she set it on fire and just gave me so much more to play off. If she came on the set, I we didn't meet before, I never, I, I, you know, I, I never say, I know she's from New York, so there we're connected. I feel like all of us who, all the actors, all the, anybody who comes out of New York is we're all related. We're all related in some way because we come from that place. Um, she came on the set, she blew it up, you know. I had no idea what to expect, and I didn't meet her beforehand, so I didn't know, you know, I knew that there was a whole bunch of different directions you could go with this character. And uh, and I probably was thinking that she was going to be really sex 
nasty and really, you know, hot and really, you know, full of it. And, uh, and Britney was just the perfect balance of all of that. And then sweet and innocent and adorable. So uh, it was simple. All I had to do was listen to her talk and then react. And, and that made for, for great chemistry. I had to cast the role of Deliverance. Um, and she, the way she was written, the script, she was written as a sort of a 16-year-old blonde, kind of wildflower, very sexy. I decided I thought I should cast somebody who was young, but maybe not entirely sexy, you know, just somebody who's trying to be sexy. And saw over a hundred different girls, very talented actresses, some were just drop it gorgeous, you know. And, uh, you know, none of them were really right. And then the name of Brittany Murphy came up, and I remember right away she played Ty in Clueless. And I had a very strong vision of her from the film, but I thought, well, oh, I don't know if she's right or not, you know. Um, so she came by, we, we, we read her, and she walked in, I was like, wow, she looks totally different. She looked nothing like the way she looked in Clueless. And right away when she started speaking, she has just such an infectious attitude. And, and her, she's always giggly, always laughing. She, just, she could just like turn a gray day into a bright sunny day just by being in the room. She read once, literally just once, and I thought, boy, this is it. As well as its talented cast, the factor which most sets drive apart from the rest of its competitors is the electric hyperkinetic fight action which permeates the drama. With the notable exception of The Matrix, no other Western production has even come close to recreating the intricate high-energy fight action indigenous to many of the Hong Kong projects, championed by directors like Jackie Chan, Sammo Hong, and Yoon Wo Ping. Steve and Koichi now reveal the secrets to their groundbreaking approach to cinema fight choreography. The big difference about shooting a fight scene like this in Drive versus a regular American film, like for instance, in a regular American action film, when they do a fight, they treat it like traditional barroom brawl. And what they do is they get two guys in there, and like, they'll do a pretty simple choreography or whatever, and the guys will go in there and they'll do a master shot. And they'll come in, they'll punch in for this guy's reaction and his punches. And they'll come back and they'll cover this guy's thing, and they'll cut it together. Well, if I may be so bold to say, I think people who do that really don't know what the hell they're doing. They just don't know. Because if you look at the way Hong Kong films are shot, the way the fight is choreographed, the way it's shot, it's all montage cutting. One shot, you see this amount, this amount of choreography, the camera moves with it, everything's there. The next shot, it's a continuation of the shot previously. The next shot, is a, there's no master shots, there's no coverage, there's no... Everything flows. It flows like water, as Bruce Lee would say. Usually, when we choreograph the fight sequence, I come up with the basic idea of the fight sequence. And as we walk through, I have a senior guy, Tatsuro, he's the leader of the alpha stance. He walks over from you know, from behind, and uh, he sees my choreography, and he comes in and adjusts my choreography because uh, he can see it as an audience point of view. Because when you choreograph by yourself, you go into it, so you don't know sometimes exactly what's good for the camera. So I have my senior guy watch me when I choreograph, and he can suggest me, oh, maybe Koichi, you should do this, you know, better for camera this way. Maybe rhythm-wise, you're doing too much pam, 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 you should get kicked here. Uh, you don't have a reaction, you know, for a while, maybe you should pan hit the guy reaction here. If I have too much reactions or too much reaction back to back, you have to break down the rhythm. So we all discuss together. And uh, now after I choreograph, I'm gonna have my junior guy, which is Yuji, perform for me. So now me and Tatsuo can watch, stay back and watch the whole sequence. So that we all have our own opinions. And Yuji is a great acrobat, he has a lot of great ideas, so he can also put ideas. So most of the time on the fight choreography, it's not just from my idea, from three of us all put together. It was kind of cool because when Koichi and I work together, we're almost, we're synchronized. You know, we do a fight scene, you know, I, what I do is I come up with the concept of the fight, like, okay, you know, these guys will have stun sticks. One hit, you know, with a stun stick and the fight's over, you know. Now let's choreograph this fight, but the catch is, we're going to put it in a tiny little motel room with some sparse furniture. Now how do we make a scene that'll kick your ass? And that, that was the concept. I, I, we go to a location, I bring Koichi's guys there, I say, go, do it. There's, they spend all day there, they're choreographing all this crazy stuff, you know, while I'm working out all the logistics of, of the shoot, and I come back in and I go, what do you got? He shows me stuff, and I go, oh, I love that, I hate that, I love that, I hate that. And I said, let's lose this, and let's change that instead. And then he goes, all right, I'll be back in 10 minutes. He choreographs more stuff, and I come back in. By the time we're done, it's like, okay, this is our fight. And then we wait, and then by the time the day comes, we're going shot by shot by shot, it's clockwork. The 
camera itself, if you watch carefully, it's all choreographed with the action. The moves are there for, for a reason. It isn't, it isn't just moving for, you know, I'm not doing monkey cam, like shaking just to create excitement. The, the camera is moving specifically with the action at the right moment. And at, that, at a certain point, it became so natural for me and Koichi to, to do this stuff. Camera angle and stuff was never ever a question. You know, it was just like, all right, this is next choreography. Okay, uh, put the dolly here, let's put on this lens here. Now when this happened, you push me in here and a couple of times we, the, the, the dolly work was so violent that I, th I flew off the camera, <laughs> you know? So it was, it, was, it was just pretty wild stuff, you know? And then the big payoff was seeing it all cut together and stuff and, you know, really just, you know, I got to hand to Koichi. I mean, he really outshined himself this time. I mean, all the projects we worked together, he really did a great job with the choreography. You know, and I was happy that I was able to do it justice by shooting it properly and editing it properly. In the finest traditions of Hong Kong filmmaking, Steve and Koichi constantly encourage the principal actors to do their own stunts where possible. Despite the inherent danger, they were more than equal to the challenge. Steve had warned me before, he, and he also warned Kadim because Kadim had never really done an action picture before. And I had done some action before, but never the type that I wanted to, as, as far as um, Hong Kong style until until Steve's project came along and he said up front from the beginning that we will be coming home with scratches and bruises and he wants the actors to make contact he wants us to make contact with the stunt people and uh, I mean, physical fighting contact and they're gonna do the same you know and he'll keep it as safe as possible but he wants it to be to be uh, as real as he can do it as, as, as we can and um, that got me excited, because I, I figured, okay, you know, we're gonna take a beating, but if the film comes out even halfway, the way we want it to, it's gonna be worth it. I do all my own stunts. I do most of Jackie Chan's stunts. I did most of Mark's stunts. Uh, yeah, I, you know, I, I, I try not to talk about it too much, but I am a stunt man. I am a stunt man. Uh, Koichi Sagamoto, who is, you know, one of the stunt gods, we were kids. We grew up together, and and and, and studying in Hong Kong, you know, I taught him some things, he taught me some things. I was a huge influence on him. And, and I just love the fact that I could get him this job, you know, because he was trying to, he was like, you know, he was down and out, he was bumming like, you know, the Power Rangers thing was nice, but, you know, nobody could ever see faces. You know, he wanted to be seen. And I said, all right, let me see, I'll talk to Steve, i talked to some of my people, I'll see if I can get you a job, because I'm working on this thing that could be pretty hot. <laughs> and 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 I'll see what I can do for you, because uh, you, know, you know we were like brothers, you know, back in the old country. Due to Steve and Koichi's expertise, very few serious injuries were actually sustained during principal photography on Drive. There were, however, a few notable exceptions. Leading man Mark DeCoscos recalls an unscheduled trip to the hospital. We we were attempting this you know this big action-packed movie, and we had a small budget, so. Um, some of the props up to that point were actually like real. Yeah. And um, we we're doing this club scene, and and I don't even think Luke was 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 striking at me. I actually hit his hand or something. And um, the club, you know, we should have had plastic ones, but like I said, budget. Uh, it was a it was a hard, heavy wooden one. Um, I kicked his hand and actually went flying out, and then ultimately hit my you know hit my own head, and I had uh, I think it was five stitches right here. So, the ne and we didn't, you know, I went to the hospital that night and got stitched up. And the next day, Kadeem and I are doing um, his girl scenes when we go to Kadeem's house. And, um, you know, he's talking about cheeseburger and all that stuff. That, that stuff was all ad lib, too, by the way. It's funny. Uh, he's talking about his wife and, and all that. And we're going through his child's bedroom. And if, if you watch that scene, you'll notice that you see Kadeem's full on close up. And you'll see me like this all the time. And the few times you do see this side, it's like, Oh, he really is Chinese, you know? Because he's kind of puffy and just swollen up. I never felt tired. It was the end when I pulled my, my knee or my hamstring or something. <laughs> we had to do the big scene at the end where we're running from the, the explosion in the background. And, you know, I just, you know, got that competition. So I want to show Mark that, you know, shit, the little guys can't run. And, you know, brothers, we got to stride. And I think I pulled my damn hamstring <laughs> trying to outrun him from the blue screen. The worst injury of all was suffered by Japanese heartthrob Masaya Kato during the filming of the climatic fight scene in the Apollo 14 nightclub. During the last scene climax, 
and Toby once in a pinch hit my inner chest. I got my rib cracked. I didn't tell the director, but I, I was really in pain. So, but my character is emotionless. So I have to, I, I can't show my emotion. So always have to be cool. So um, that was very, very hard time for me. A particularly memorable experience for all three principal stars was the explosive finale to the motel battle sequence. In the absence of a budget for CGI effects, real life-size projectiles were fired just over their heads to create the level of authenticity Steve required for this key sequence. Uh, Brittany, Kadeem and I, we come running around the corner of the motel and we're heading, we just run away from the, from the baddies and we, we come around and there's old J.P. Ferguson with his, with his rocket launcher, right? He's got a rocket launcher. As we come around the corner, he's coming around pointing at us and the three of us realized, oh boy. So we're like, ah, you know, running away from, from this whole thing. And uh, on the previous take, I guess we had run maybe too soon or too fast and there was a big gap between the rocket and our heads. And uh, uh, it's probably Steve, because he likes getting us in dangerous situations, but he said, you know, you know, try to a little closer and stuff, so we did, and, and I could kind of feel the wind go right past my head, and I was hoping that was close enough, but you never know with Koichi and Steve, you know. Oh, and I love the, uh, the explosion, because I really got to be there for that, and I felt that. I, when, they, when they blew up the hotel, when uh, Madison blows up the hotel, and we worked it out, Koichi, we ran, and we had to jump in the air, and so I always, you know, that's why I wanted to be an actor from the time I was a kid, so that, you know, you could pretend like the world was ending, or things were blowing up, and people were shooting, and at the end of the day, nobody's hurt, it's just, you know, pretend. So the, actually, this is the first time I really got to do it, because I've been doing comedy, but comedy without action, comedy, you know, just a different, you know, sitcom, and other kind of stuff, when, you know, when I, when we were running and they shot those missiles at us and you could and, and I could actually hear the first one because I was next to Brittany and Mark was in the back because he was the Superman. So when that thing whizzed by his head and bust through that window, there was an adrenaline, you know, that, you know, I know we were supposed to kind of pace ourselves and take our time running through each one because it was like run, bang, run, bang, run, bang, and then run and then jump. After the first bang, I went to fifth gear and I was like, I'm getting the hell out of here, man. This fucking thing might hit me. As well as working 24-7 to make the fights come within the meager budgetary requirements, Steve also hired second unit director and miniature effects wizard Wyatt Weed and sound impresario Les Claypool to work their magic and give Drive some real production values in these vital areas at a fraction of the normal cost. Due to the numerous locations, the nightclub, the ships at the beginning, all these places, we knew we would need a good Foley team and uh, I knew of a, a pair of Foley guys, John Cucci and Dan O'Connell, who had done huge movies. I mean, their, their mainstay is things like um, Con Air, Nutty Professor, all A-level films, they do a lot of action films, um, The Rock, and we knew we really couldn't afford them, but we knew they were perfect for the job, so what we ended up doing was spotting out key things that would be really important for them to do, S signature effects, like all the sounds of the ship in the beginning, running up and down all those metal grates, and a lot of the fight sounds, and, and clothing flutters and things, stuff we knew they'd be really good at. We pegged them to do all of those sounds, and then more of the generic sounds we just had other people do, like setting, you know, there's no reason to hire those guys to set down glasses and take off glasses and rustle pieces of paper and things, so. We, uh, we had them do the specialty stuff, and, and it made a huge, huge difference. They, they're just, we bow to them. <laughs> they are quite amazing uh, at what they do. A key effect sequence for the second unit team was the spectacular demolition of the Apollo 14 nightclub at the end of the movie. The explosions there were handled by Joe Viscosal, who we all know, he revolutionized miniature pyrotechnics. He, he did the explosions in Star Wars and then moved on to, you know, things like Independence Day, where I think he blew up more stuff than in any other film ever. But uh, he was using 
a lot of the same pyrotechnic mixes that he had used on Apollo 13. And if you watch the sequence where the, the final big hotel explosion goes off and the rocket flies up into the air, if you look at the flame underneath, it looks just like the flame of the Saturn V rocket starting up in Apollo 13. He used almost the exact same mix. And it was really exciting to know that we were using Apollo 13 technology on, on our film. We had one chance to do that. There was no reset, we'll be back in two days to shoot it again. And we didn't have like, you know, a truck full of replacement parts. It was one time, you do it once, you get the best you can. So I was, I was the one on the wire to bring the rocket over on cue. And the adrenaline rush you get when you realize, okay, you got 20 guys out there, and you got cameras rolling high speed, and, and it all depends on this, and you've got the wire. And if you don't hit the cue right, you don't have an explosion scene. Watch this. This is new. Watch this. Wyatt, thank you. It was a very good job. Thank oh you. My God. Oh my I recorded it. <laughs> Whereas Steve and I had long history of watching Hong Kong films, most of the sound team did not. So there was a lack of differentiation between blocks and punches and some of the things that, that it was so overwhelming. There were so many of them that what Steve and I ended up doing one day as we came back into the studio, since he and I had you know, years of experience watching this, we uh, actually cut some of them ourselves. We, he, we, we went in and folded blocks and punches and we were smacking each other around in the, uh, one of the uh, vocal booths until we were both red, hitting each other in the stomach and arm slaps and just trying to get really good sounds for all the, the fights. Having battled successfully against the odds to produce one of the most electrifying martial arts action adventures ever made, Steve would suffer the ultimate disappointment at the hands of the studio executives who took his finished project and cut out 16 minutes of footage which Steve felt were absolutely crucial to the overall structure of the movie. The biggest difference between my version and the HBO version is the change in motivation of Toby Wong's character. Um, in the released version, because so much of his backstory, in fact all of his backstory was cut out, and uh, there's this whole reference to the birthday card and why he was here, um, because by cutting that out, now Toby came here for the money. He became a mercenary. And I was quite upset about that because that wasn't the character that I was trying to portray as a filmmaker. I thought, who was going to care about a mercenary? A guy comes here for the money, you know? So, I, so I really, you know, I really had a difficult time kind of getting through that, you know, and just kind of you know, one thing that's really, I guess, the hardest thing to deal with is, as a filmmaker is that you don't really have a whole lot of control over your film at a certain point. I finished the movie, it was mixed, DTS, six track, delivered. And then a decision came down, you know, where I was not involved to cut the film down substantially. And by cutting stuff down, every, every scene you cut out, you start to change the perce audience's perception of what this film is. And by the time this version was done, it had taken the motivations of the characters and thrown out the window or changed it completely to the point that it became very shallow and that was you know upsetting because I felt so helpless to not to be able to do anything about it but I just want the audience if you were watching this version to know that you know that that was not my intention you know that as a filmmaker it's my job to make characters to create characters that they like you know that way when they get to the kung fu they can really root for these guys You know, this was one of the few cases I can think of where more was better because 
the characters were more fleshed out. The story was more fleshed out. The action was, I mean, everything about the film was so much more fleshed out in, in the early versions that Steve had done. And there were a lot of people looking at it just in terms of a length, running time, got to get it down, got to get it down. And this is one of those few films where, no, you know, don't get it down. The longer it is, the better. The main actual score was done by Dave Williams, and I was quite saddened that that was removed from the release cut. Um, it was not something I was involved in um, because I just felt that my vision was so violated that I didn't want anything to do with it. But um, but what I felt strongly with Dave Williams' music is that it really served the film well because this film, in trying to do a temp score for test screenings before the film was finished. Even I had a really hard time finding sort of temporary music to stick in the film, just to you know keep the film pace going, just so the audience can get a general feeling of what this film is about. The film was so quirky at times and serious, and it was a hard balance to keep. And that's and that's what I felt was strongly about Dave Williams' score is that he he was able to sustain and he was able to balance the quirkiness with the action and put the heart in the areas that I really felt needed it. Producers cut, unfortunately, they kind of went for, they kind of just went for the straight ahead action. These guys are tough, and once they go into this mode, they do it. It still works, I think. But um, the director's cut is the whole thing. You get, you get the crying, you get the loving, you get the fighting, you get the funny jokes, you get everything. That's the version I like. Despite the difficulties involved with the shoot and subsequent distribution of the movie, Everyone involved with the DRIVE project is proud of their achievements. The ultimate tribute to the movie and their skill as filmmakers is the incredible reaction it generates with cinema audiences, no matter where it is screened around the world. We took it to Japan, to the Yuri Film Festival, the Japan's second biggest film festival. Went there, the Japanese audience went wild. I've seen films with Japanese audience. They're quiet, they're really respectful and nice. And then when the film's finished, then they'll clap. This movie, they were jumping and screaming and laughing, and I was just amazed at this. And it won the Critics Award there. And then it went to Montreal, and you know, and just we had a screening, and the audience, the same exact kind of reactions, crazy jumping out of the chair, laughing their head off. And at the end of the film, you know, I mean, end of the festival, they voted it first place, you know, international film. And the, it was the fans voting it, not the, the committee, but it actually was the fans. And. That really meant a lot to me. When I've seen my work in other movies, you know, when it comes to the fight scene, in my mind I'll start picking it apart. Oh, that was a bad angle for this, or I should have done this or that. And when I went to drive and, and saw the, the screening of it, oh man, I was so happy. I was so happy because everything flowed and was in context. And, and when it got to the fight sequences, man, I just thought, Koichi's fight choreography was awesome. Steve shot it so, so well. I mean, he just captured the movement and the moment, not, not, only, not, not just in the action, but in the emotion, you know? I, I, I loved it. I, I, I really loved it. And um, I had a great time working on the movie. I mean, all the elements together. I just, I, I just think we had chemistry. And once in a great while, a bunch of people come together and do something very special and to me drive is very special I think it works uh, on an acting level and as an action picture for me all my attempts all my effort to to bring alive this martial arts genre what I wanted to do with it what I you know always being a fan and wanting to see this stuff 
was that now I'm in a position where I am giving something back to the very thing that inspired me as a child, you know, and still continues to inspire me. So it's very special to me that I can give that piece back, you know, and now have, have people have expectations of me to deliver action-packed films that are fun to watch and that are really exciting. So that to me is really special. You guys okay? We're doing our thing, man. <laughs> Beat it. I didn't call him. Nice. Who's that? Was that the director? A little bit, you, you can see what he's doing. It's fantastic, Freddie. Wow. I'm the sensei. I taught him all that shit. You hang with us, and you, 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 you get yeah. I'm the sensei. Mm -hmm. I taught him all that shit. You hang with us, you still have it. Oh, yeah, right. Oh, I want to watch. Hey. This is Hakeem Cardison. <laughs> <laughs> That's gonna be a cut, right? <laughs>